Welcome to Reaction TV. I'm Maggie Pagano, editor of Reaction, and with me today is William Clouston, leader of the Social Democratic Party, which is a political party which many of you uh, may remember from the 1980s, the Gang of Four left Labour, and also many might not realise that it still exists. But I think over the next few months, we're going to see an awful lot more of you, um, William. Would that be fair to say that you've been sort of working away at grassroots level, but in fact, yeah. and indeed, I th think he told me the other day that at the next election, you'd be fielding between 60 and 100 candidates. So that all sounds very exciting. T tell me tell me where you are. Well, we've, we've um, the, the resurgence of the SDP has taken a few years, like all mm -hmm. sort of, one day we'll, Maggie will be an overnight success. Of and, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll be able to say, well, it took a few years and it always does. So it's just a case of steady progress. Um, I suppose the key things are, you know, are we are we making progress each quarter and each year? And we are. So uh, membership's grown nicely. Uh, we've, you know, done recently very well in uh, local elections and took a, yeah. a, a quite a good seat. Yeah, in, uh, in Leeds. Leeds. Yeah, so yeah. We're, we're making progress and we're looking forward to the next election. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what is the response to people? Is it a little bit, as I hinted, that... They perhaps still don't know that you exist and then need to understand. And I mean, the one thing everybody says at the moment, we're fed up with tribal politics, left and right, you know, go hang yourselves. What we need is a third force. I haven't mentioned the Lib Dems there, but, you know, a, a fresh new alternative. Yeah, well, the, that's a good point because the Lib Dems aren't, I mean, that's not new anything, is it? The Our basic case is there's been far too much liberalism of, of, of both kinds, social and economic. Yeah. And all the parties are infected with this. In, far, in fact, they're all rather similar, aren't they? Well, Having got yeah. to tell them apart. Um, so I think you do, the case is that you do need uh, a new force in British politics, but it's got to be something that represents about half the public. So half the public are where we are. Um, I acknowledge that a lot of the public don't know we're around yet, mm. but we're trying to correct that. But half the public are roughly where we are, which is, uh, you know, patriotic, but economically left-leaning and culturally people say it's to the right i don't think it is but but you know culturally traditional socially conservative yeah it's interesting that people want to compartmentalize you and that you have to in a way define yourself by those um stereotypes if you like i mean to be patriotic socially perhaps conservative family and so forth immediately on the right but that's a nonsense the traditional labor party actually had all those uh, uh beliefs did they not and indeed this, but also the conservatives today are hardly a free market um a dynamic uh party that is due you know if you like all the forces of business growth they've become well the biggest state spender for the last 20 years so yeah. in a sense you've got to break all those uh shibboleths as well haven't you so so give me a flavor um for your thinking maybe on some of the, the big issues. Uh, I know housing is one of your um, perhaps yeah. most, uh, meaty, isn't it? And you've just come up with a very yeah. radical new policy document. Talk me through that a bit, William. Yeah, housing is a key uh, policy area, particularly for the young. Um, we've, you know, if you speak to young people, particularly in the South of England where pressure is greatest, uh, it's the biggest issue. You know, the, the prospects for young people to find a place of their own. I mean, it's generation rent. You know, that's what they're faced with. Very, very high rate. If you're a young person getting a job in the capital now, uh, it's not unusual to spend half of your disposable income on, on rent. Mm -hmm. uh, the routes to you getting your own place, are, unless you have help from parents or grandparents, uh, are not realistic. Uh, the routes to pair up, do the normal thing, which previous generations did, pair up, uh, find a place of your own and possibly have a house mm. to raise a family are really unrealistic for many, many people. So yeah. there is a crisis and not, you know, I, I think it's, we feel it particularly at the sort of uh, pro-family end because, you know, uh, the birth rate's falling in Britain. Uh, mm. There's been a casual, almost reckless attitude towards this by politicians, don't even think about it. Many of them, I think, don't care about it. We're cursed with a, a generation of politicians that are basically indifferent about these things. And, uh, you know, they're sitting by fiddling where, while the total fertility rate uh, falls and, and housing is linked to that. 
So it's it's the family side that we really care about on, on, on housing. There is an acute side. I mean, homelessness is a problem. That's a slightly separate issue. Yeah. Uh, beds in sheds and all, all this sort of thing and multiple occupation is also an issue. But it's the family, really, that we, we care about. And we've just published a set of new policies on that, which are quite interesting. Yeah, and you are, well, I think the only party um, that is proposing that actually the state should start building houses again, that it's the most efficient mechanism by which yeah. to do that. Um, how yeah. would you, and I think in the document you say you'd like to see in the first year 100,000 new state homes, um, yeah. state-built homes. How, how would that work? Can you... Can well, you it will take anything? time. Just before I get there, Maggie, yeah. I think just to, just to, it's worth spending a wee bit of time just thinking about the, the, the problems because, you know, I'm, I'm actually fed up with, with, with reading... Uh, think tank pieces from think tanks in SW1. Uh, usually the, the right-wing think tanks produce these <clears throat> and they talk about the planning system or zonal planning or, you know, there's an interesting thing. I think PX produced something on, on street boats <clears throat> uh, for redevelopments in uh, peripheral housing in London. All very interesting, but it won't. And all of this stuff does not address, it doesn't diagnose the problem properly. And if you look at why we've got a housing crisis, it's basically down to two factors. Uh, the first factor is a deliberate de uh, destruction of state capacity in house building. Now, if you go back to 1970, uh, you know, the post-war period, the Attlee Macmillan period, uh, the state outbuilt the private sector in many, many years. It was not unusual at all. 1970 was the last year that happened. Uh, it was fairly even Stevens in the 70s. And then after Mrs. Thatcher got in, it slowly literally withered on the, on the vine. And I think looking at it basically, if you're sort of looking at a bird's eye view, table view, you cannot take out an entire sector of the, of, of the housing, house building system and expect not, to have no problems. I mean, you, they've, they've demolished this sector, taken it out altogether mm -hmm. and replaced it with <clears throat> a, a little bit of uh, housing association uh, building, which usually is 25,000 uh, units a year, which is not, not a fair swap. I mean, as I say, in 1970, about 180,000 council houses were built and about 174,000 in the private sector. You know, it was roughly even Stevens. You take that out, and, you know, you were down to sort of 3,000 a year now. So it's been destroyed, and it shouldn't be a surprise to people that if you do that, there'll be effects. So I would say that's the diagnosis. The solution yeah. to the problem is to, is to generate state house building again. And the other, the other flip side, the other side of the problem, which a lot of people... Uh, you know, from from the from the you know liberal left won't acknowledge this, and the economic right won't acknowledge this. Is the high immigration? Yeah. If you have a policy of destroying state capacity in house building, and you combine that with very very high levels of net migration, mm -hmm. you'll end up with a housing crisis, and that's what we've yeah. got. It's no, it isn't really a. a it's not rocket science in a sense. No, it's, it's not rocket science. science if you yeah. think about it. Yeah. 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 Uh, what about one of the big arguments, which is, uh, um, let's accept, uh, you know, the lack of supply, but also our very, um, how can I say, backward, NIMBY uh, planning system, where basically uh, it's not just the locals who are NIMBYs, but actually most planning um, uh, councils don't want to really build either. How do you think that, I mean, how big uh, an issue do you think that is and how do you over overcome it? I don't think it's much of an issue at all. Uh, I, it, it's a uh, contrarian view. Yeah, no, I mean, it, I, I, I'm a I'm a Chartertown planner by by trade originally, and then I switched to surveying and development. But um, and it's not just because I'm a planner that I say this. But planning authorities are under a legal duty to to have a a, a twenty year land supply in the development plan system, so they've got to have it. Mm. Now, uh, the reason that. Um, private house builders, land bank, and don't put all those houses out at once is basic economics, and not in their interest to do it. Why would they do it? Yeah. Have a look at the annual reports of, uh, of Leach and Bellway and Barclay Homes and the others. Have a look at them, right? They're very well land banked, mm -hmm. but it's not in their interest to roll out those houses instantly. Quite often on a scheme, if house uh, prices are going up <clears throat> vertically, they'll make more money on in a year's increase in house prices, they went on the sort of profit element of building the houses themselves. Which are very tight margins, in fact, aren't they? Very, very tight margins, yes. Yeah. So they, they, you know, I'm afraid <laughs> they're under, a lot of people don't grasp that the, the, the land supply is actually there if you look at the development plans. Mm. That isn't really the problem. 
I, I, th I mean, I can accept in the press it gets, it, it, it's the problem of knowing a little bit about a subject and then reading journalism about it is a different yeah. thing. <laughs> and it's often not, very superficial. Sadly. Yeah, it's not, it's yeah. not, I mean, people don't, 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 don't understand it. And actually as a job, I, I started at Westminster City Council and Development Troll, but I ended up in the years I worked uh, for local authorities in doing development mm -hmm. planning at Enfield and actually, you know, and was responsible not for housing, but for retail in this case, mm -hmm. of, of planning a supply uh, for, uh, for for retail warehouses and supermarkets, so you, you've got to do it. I mean, it's not it's not the case that the planning system has failed in a sense. Mm. I think nimbyism is a problem, but I I think there's plenty of um, there's plenty of urban land and brownfield sites which you can use. And actually, the SDP's policy mm. it, it, you know, is, is strongly pro-urban. I mean, I, what we what we're mm. arguing for is is uh, it'll interest some of your your listeners here. Mm. We're, we're try we, we asked ourselves, what model would you use to get housing back on yeah. business? And we, we are re-instilling, uh, basically, uh, something that Thatcher did in, in, in this, which is, you remember the Urban Development Corporations, uh, yes. you know, Docklands and Tynaway Development Corporation, they actually achieved a lot because they were single-focused units charged with regeneration. They were given the power and the resources to do it. So we think in housing, if you combine new what we call county housing uh, corporations with yeah. the powers the planning powers and resources mm -hmm. to do it the single folks to do it they could do all the land assembly mm -hmm. put the sites together and build them and you'd, you'd start to deal with the problem but sadly actually for for young people it's going to take a long time for the problem to be sorted it won't be done overnight. but you know basically i think we've got the diagnosis right we've thought very carefully about it mm -hmm. we don't make policy you know on the hoof in the SDP, we're a small party. We think very carefully about it, and I think this this um, county housing corporation idea is a good one in a housing yeah. crisis. And it also um, fits in with, if you like, the the real dynamic, which I think a lot of people miss. You know, keep going over the southeast. You know, prices have gone up thirty percent, um, and in the north they're still quite low. But I mean, the reality is. That most people or a lot of people want to work in the southeast is the Dick Whittington syndrome. You know, people will find their fortune here. Um, so, absolutely, what we should be doing is filling all those areas—the the brownfields and all the you know sites around London—rather um, than infilling tiny bits around the country. Um, yeah. And um, so, if you well, have those 40, single purpose, sorry, yeah, forty percent of graduate jobs are in London. Yeah. I mean, there is a exactly. separate, entirely separate pro problem that we have yeah. about, you know, the prioritization of services in the city of London. But th that's a slightly separate one. Where we are now, 40 percent of, of graduate jobs are in London. So people have to, kids have to go. Yeah. Right. At the, at the moment, they, they have no prospect of, of having very much money at the end of the month if they have to spend over half of their salaries. Yeah on uh, very, very high rents. Yeah. And Andy Street in Birmingham actually has um, sort of made this one of his top priorities and already during his term has seen a shift because they've built a lot of local housing. They've also improved, improved local transport links. So it's actually, I can't remember the figure, but over the last few years, if you like, there hasn't been the big um, exile to London or immigration to, to London. It's actually kept people yeah. locally. It's interesting. I mean, I, yeah, I trained as a planner in, I in, uh, went to a university in, in, in Birmingham. So it's, an, I mean, they are not short of brownfield land there at, at all. No. So if you had, if you dropped a, a housing young corporation in, in Birmingham and said, get on with it, yeah. boy, they could do some, some work. Yeah, no, absolutely. What about, um, and how would you work the state housing? You'd continue the right to buy, um, would you, over a certain period? How would the mechanics of that work? And also, how would you fund it? We would have we would we would have a, a moratorium on right to buy initially because I think you have to build the stock up again. I mean, the I'm not against right to buy in principle. That was a major um, social revolution for the people that uh, that took advantage of it in the 80s, mm. uh, and I'm not against that. Uh, what I'm against is the seven to one ratio of right to buy uh, loss in the of the stock. Right. Mm. So I mean, you know, that was the ratio. Wow. Yeah. You know, seven to one. Yes. Yeah, so. It has to be one to one. You, you, and also, I don't, I don't really approve. We haven't ironed out specific detail on this. I don't approve massive um, discounts. I think I don't like politicians buying votes no. in a crude way like that. But I think uh, you know, person wanting to buy, it's, it's, a, it's a good aim, and uh, and, and the state 
could support it. Mm. Um, so yeah, after a short moratorium, I think we you know, we'd certainly bring that back. Mm. But um, on on how you'd fund it, this is this is a, a, a an interesting thing. So it may surprise you, or it may not, that actually the government spends quite a lot of money on in the housing sector already. So you, they spend about 26, 27 billion quid a year on housing benefit. Yeah. And they've got their little pet schemes, usually like uh, help to buy and things. But remember, help to buy is all plus fee for price. So it doesn't actually solve anything. That's just a little, that's a little biscuit they give to their funders. You know, remember the Tories received 10 billion a year from the house builders <laughs> to get the policy right. So they- Only 10 know, billion. <laughs> yeah, in yeah. 10, 10 million, yeah. So they, you know, they, they, uh, they spend, the government spend a lot on housing anyway, but they spend it on the wrong thing. So you, I, would, I would slowly divert some of that 26 billion into building houses. I think that's a necessary correction. They only spend about 6 billion on building houses. So to do a scheme of our size, to, you know, to mm -hmm. set up housing on corporations everywhere, uh, what, what would you do? You need, you need, you know, seven or eight or nine billion just to start that. Where would you get it from? We, we had a look at this and actually taking something from Loom Halligan's book, Home Truths, which is, yeah. is a great book. book. Great book. I recommend it. Mm -hmm. uh, Liam, actually, I interviewed him for STP Talk, and I, he, he doesn't agree. He, he'd be happier sort of outsourcing the building to the private sector. I just disagree with him. Mm -hmm. I, I also disagree with him on immigration. He thinks there's you know, very little to do with it. I think it's everything to do with it, and, and you've mm -hmm. got to have lower immigration. <clears throat> but leaving that aside, I do take an idea in Liam's book, mm. about um, raising money from effectively t taxing something called planning gain. It's a little bit technical and it always takes a wee bit of time to explain it. But basically, mm. you can imagine a greenfield site somewhere, private house, house builder gets consent for it. The, let's, say it's a, let's say it's agricultural land and, and, and it's priced that sort of valued about 10,000 mm. an acre. And then it goes up to a million or two million an acre. Mm. That jump in, in value mm is attributable to it being granted planning consent. Mm -hmm. Now, at the moment, that jump in value goes to the landowner. People think it goes to the house builder. But it's, it's, it does if the yeah. house builder options it early. It's all a bit yeah. technical, but basically- yeah. It's mainly the landowners, isn't it? Yeah, yeah a, a landowner that's advised properly mm. should, 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 will be benefiting from that massive jump in value. But then you've got to ask yourself, what, what gave rise to the jump in value? I mean, it, if it's in a village, it's because the village has a school, has a mm. church, has a, mm. you know, shops and a library and so on, and certain pubs and so on. The, it's there because of the capital, the social capital and the other infrastructure. In the community. Mm. Exactly. So it isn't, you know, it's not unreasonable on the grant of planning commission, which is after all is a state and no one's arguing for that. Well, apart from very libertarian right people is arguing that we should get rid of, the, you know, the state's control over land use planning. Um, no, you know, uh, it's perfectly reasonable for the state to say, look, we'll, we'll share it with you 50 50. Now, if you get your calculator out and you ask, what is the value of plan and gain uplifts mm. um, nationally on greenfield land per annum? It runs to, you know, taxing half of that would be about six, seven, or eight billion to, from year to mm -hmm. year, which wow. is sufficient mm. to start our program. And I think that's very reasonable. So, what we're arguing for, Maggie, is a uh, is a, a, a policy which is, is socially conservative, gets the mm. state back into the house building industry, basically, mm. uh, slowly but surely, and it doesn't give rise to any uh, uh, increase in general taxation. Mm. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, I've argued before in, in a recent piece that it's a, it's a policy so sensible and social conservative that mm. obviously none of the existing... <laughs> <laughs> parties will support it. But too obvious, story, too simple. Yeah, yeah but and too and too revolutionary. But in a way, but it's too, it, it's too. But all social conservatives should, and mm -hmm. and I think anyone, I really, you know, I think this is the important point. Anyone that cares about kids and you know mm -hmm. family formation mm -hmm. and the family as a unit should support this policy. Mm -hmm. And I, I just urge them to because mm -hmm. you you know it's not. Uh, I, I said in a speech <laughs> a few years ago, what is more. People go on about all the wokery and stuff that goes on mm. nowadays. But I, I think the conservatives' policies, and Labour were just as bad, actually, the conservatives' policies on housing are probably more socially destructive and anti-conservative than all of the woke stuff. So I, I, I think they... I, I think exactly. we should have a look at what we're, we're advising. They certainly should. Um, yeah, I don't know why Michael Gove hasn't stolen it, uh, hook, line and sinker, actually. 
Um, I would have thought it might appeal to him. But yeah. if, we, if we, going back in time, uh, two, two points, um, uh, when um, I think it was Churchill, wasn't it, who actually put Macmillan in charge of the house building, and he recognised post-war just how crucial it was to rebuilding the country. It was a masterstroke. And also the taxing on land, um, actually, I've probably got my dates wrong, but um, again, that was in existence, wasn't it, until the Conservatives abolished it in the early 60s. 61. So it's not as though... Hmm? It was a Land Conversation Act in 61. 61, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that was a, a retrograde step. And in fact, most, most certainly in Europe, most states tax uh, plan and gain of that kind. <coughs> do substantial. they? Yeah, they do. And, and it's, you know, just in any village, you only have to look. I mean, we have little things like, you know, Section 106 funds or what are now called um, community yeah. infrastructure levies. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because that in a way is the way that the private developer contributes to the community. But are you saying that this would be a much more effective way? Yeah, that's a, that's mm -hmm. a I mean, that's a minnow and, and what we're proposing is a pipe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is different. Yeah, this is a completely different order. And I, I say it's not unreasonable. I think we thought very carefully about what the proportion mm -hmm. should be. I mean, and again, I've, I've worked in, 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 in developments and I've actually, you know, built a few few houses myself and they, they, uh, all that, you actually, uh, you know, commercial development is my, was my specialism. But uh, mm -hmm. people say, well, you know, it'll, it'll disincentivize. I promise you it won't. I mean, it, no, no landowner or site finder or developer or house builder is not going to pursue a scheme because they only make 25 million when they could have made 50. I promise you. No, no, they it's won't. Not, it's not going to happen. Doesn't I mean, you could okay. perhaps counterintuitively say it might be more of an incentive because if rather than land banking and waiting for the appropriate moment, they all know that the whole system, the whole process is working more smoothly, pay out a little bit and get the development going. It may. I, I just don't. I, I do, as I say, I, I'm, I'm speaking as someone that's worked in the industry th over mm -hmm. 30 years. I, d I, I don't think it make any significant material difference to mm -hmm. how, the, how the private mm -hmm. sector operates at all. It, it, uh, it will upset, I mean, you have to acknowledge, it will upset some landowners that are affected by this, but, mm. you, you know, you, you, you're, what you, if, you, if you're against this policy, what you're arguing for is you're arguing for more Lamborghinis and yachts and fewer houses for kids. I mean, I just yeah. don't, it just, it's just... Not it's a bad not, trade off, is it? No, no. no. Uh, just as a um, side point, what would you do about the current sort of social affordable element that builders um, have to comply with. It always seemed to be a bit of a gimmick to me. I mean, all housing should be affordable to certain, you know, yeah. relative, isn't it? Well, I, I, I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't do anything to it initially. I mean, but you've got to remember, Maggie, that uh, affordable housing and the uh, registered social landlords and the landlords and so on, that, that the, the sort of slight growth in that was a, um, a sort of symptom of, 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 of large scale state sector house, mm. house building being taken off the table. Um, but as I say, it's a poor substitute. I, I'm not actually, a, a, you know, I don't, I don't want to be destructive. There are some very good housing associations, particularly the smaller ones, actually. The, the mm. large scale transfers out of council housing into the big ones, I don't think, personally, I don't think they're as good. But mm. there are some very good small ones, and particularly in the big cities. Yeah. And it wouldn't be my intention to, uh, you know, to, to, to affect what to they do at all. You know, continue doing that work. What we're looking at in in the uh, county housing corporations is to create something new. Uh, you know, which which is starts up. I think existing stock in local authorities, we we argue, should be transferred out to the new agencies because it makes sense. But okay. I'm, I'm not I'm not I'm not sort of wanting to smash the the the, the housing the, association the sector. No. 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 OK. I think, William, we're about to run out of time and that was fascinating and I hope we will talk much more regularly. Uh, but just give me a feel for going back to um, your the next election, which who knows, Bojo might well try and even run this year, although I'm not sure Her Majesty will allow it. Um, yeah. But, you know, you, you are funded by your members, by your supporters, and, but you, and you hope next time to have up to 100 candidates. Um, is that really, that's... Well, that's that's the upper limit. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I think you know we had to, we had you know uh, twenty last time, and that was quite a mm -hmm. short notice election. I think sixty would be a good target for us. Yeah, uh, and we want to give as many people the opportunity to vote for us as possible because the simple reason is you know people go into the ballot uh, booth and they and they want something decent to vote for. And I think we are a decent alternative. 
it reflects mainstream opinion. We're a little bit different. It is a syncretic red and blue approach. I mean, you had red Tory and the blue Labour, the small elements in those big parties, but we are actually driving the car on this and you can actually vote for us and get people elected. So, yeah, we're going to do our best. Wonderful. I shall follow with great interest and we'll talk again very soon. And, Thank you. Uh, you know, and if the Prime Minister is sensible, he will steal your housing policy. But I'm not yep. sure he's that smart, maybe. <laughs> anyway, okay. we'll talk Thank again you. soon. Bye. Bye-bye.